Let's go over to Ephesians chapter 4, and I'd like to continue something I began last week. Last week, I wrote, if God wrote your biography, you all remember that? If you're with us, what, what would it say? Now, I'll review that in just a moment. But let me read two verses here to get us started. Uh, chapter 4 of Ephesians, verses 23 and 24, read like this. And that ye be renewed in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God. In the likeness of who? Be renewed in the spirit of your mind and put on the new self, which is, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of what? Truth. Of truth. In the likeness of God. In Genesis chapter number one, Elohim created. And we know how he did that. And whose likeness was man created? In Elohim's. That's the word there in Genesis 1 and 2. Okay, keep that in mind as we go through. But let me just give you a little review. So if God wrote your biography, what would he write? Now, what's that, Rose? You're in the likeness of God, Rose. That's right. That's what it says. All right. Remember, God wrote about our new birth. And we were marked out before creation. Ephesians chapter 1, verses 4 and 5. Okay, that's what we saw. We received the nature of God's divine Son and His DNA, His spiritual DNA. And we might say, because we're made in the likeness of God, we have God's DNA. Simple? All right, keep that in mind as we go on here. And you can see that in 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. Okay. You receive the new set of spiritual senses. Now, this is what God has written. About whom? About me. About you. All right. Remember that. Spiritual sight you now have, 2 Corinthians 4.18. Spiritual healing or hearing, Revelation 3.20. Spiritual taste, Hebrews 6, 4 and 5. Spiritual touch and smell, 2 Corinthians 2.14. That's what we've received, and that's what God has written, and said, this is what you have, okay, as you see this. You became a new creation. Dan read the verse this morning as part of his study, 2 Corinthians 5, 17. Any man be in Christ, he's a new what? Free, new creation, okay? You were given a new conscience. One Okay, outside of your passions and in tune with God. That's what we were given. Actually, the life of Christ, we'd say, himself has been given to us. And it's a wonderful thing as, as you think about that. You know, our studies with my brother Tim, and as I continue reading the, the material he sent me, I find it awesome that God gave us a conscience and a subconscious, okay? And there's so much to teach on that when I totally understand it. But it seems so simple, all right, that God could do something like that to help us, but yet you know what we've done with it? Nothing. We buried it in the backyard and forgotten about it, okay? And the reason being because we want to see everything, everything in the flesh. But what did Dan t teach us about? In 2 Corinthians chapter 5 this morning. We know no man after the flesh. All right? We have to get ourselves in tune with the spiritual thing that God has going. Therefore, in this section or chapter of your biography, let's notice your growth and your development. That's what I want to talk about here this morning. Your growth and your development. Won't take too long, I don't think, but let's look at this. Now remember, who is speaking here? Look at it this way. God is speaking directly to you because this is what he has done for you, all right? What he has done for you. Now, we're in chapter 4 of Ephesians, so let's come over to verse number 15, please, all right? Verse number 15. But speaking the truth in love, 
We are to grow up in all aspects into him who is the head, even Christ. Now he's the head of the body. And we understand that. But we are to do what here? Verse 15. To grow up in all aspects into him. Aspects of whom Jesus Christ is. And who was Jesus Christ? Well, Hebrews chapter number 1 tells us what? The first three verses. He's the exact imprint. He is a radiance of his father, of God. That's who he is. So if we grow up into Christ, we're growing up into whom? Into God. See, that, that's what it's all about here as you look at it. And what God's trying to show us is this. This is who you are. And he's written that to us for our edification so we know this is what it's all about. I often wonder, the, the moment I give up my last breath, whenever that might be, I always compare it to my dad. He made it to 79. Of course, he had a lot of heart problems and that sort of thing. But who knows what, when your time comes. But what's going to happen when you're standing before the Lord? Most people that are believers do this. Oh, the judgment seat of Christ. Now, let me tell you something about the judgment seat of Christ. It takes place every day in your life. All right. I'm not going to go up there and stand before a judge with a jury and all that and have everything read to me. No, everything's, I'm forgiven, right? Among other things, okay, I'm, I'm forgiven. Uh, the account of my sin, when it happens, happens here, see? So I'm not worried about that. So what's he going to read to me up there? He's going to read my biography. Dan, welcome. See? Here's the rest of the saints. Go visit your mom and dad, your brothers and sisters, your wife, your uncles and aunts, your grandmother, those who you knew on earth. I mean, to me, it's a wonderful anticipation, say. And the reason being, what's that, dear? A reunion, that's right. Miss Rose said it'll be a reunion. And I, and I believe that. And I have lists of people on my desk that I want to talk to when I get to heaven. One of them's Mary and Martha and different people from the Old Testament and the New Testament just to get there. What were you thinking when this happened? I mean, the good things, you know, as, as you look at it. So that brings us, therefore, down to Ephesians chapter 4. Notice verse 22, please. And I'm going to read through 24, 22 to 24 where it says that in reference to your former manner of life, you laid aside what? The old self. Isn't that what it says? Are you with me here? Chapter 4 of Ephesians, verse 22. What's your say, Rose? There you go. I just read that. <laughs> it's hard for Rose to see that. That in reference to your former manner of life, you laid aside the old self. We heard that this morning in Sunday school. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, right? Which is being corrupted in accordance with the lusts of what? Deceit. And that you be renewed in the spirit of your mind. Now this is our text in the spirit of your mind, and put on the new self, which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of what? Of the truth. Created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Where do we get the truth from? And where did that come from? From God himself. All right? As you look at this. I have been reading, every day I've been <laughs> reading parts of Psalm 78 has 72 verses in it. And it's kind of like a history of Israel from the time God took them out of Egypt all the way up into giving them a king, et cetera, et cetera. Okay? And you know what the common thing is in there? You did not listen to me. And therefore, your heart had no part of me. And as I read that, it's so sad. Because there were great people in Israel, weren't there? Yes. But on the whole, what happened? They didn't listen. They had ears to hear, but didn't hear. All right? Didn't read. 
didn't understand what God was trying to accomplish with them. And so they were failures. And so today, now hang in here with me. I don't want to get too doctrinal here. But today there's a brand new Israel. Where do I read that? Galatians chapter number six. The Israel of God, whose father is Abraham. And it's not a physical thing at all. It's a spiritual thing. See? I mean, to me, it, it's a wonderment as, as you look at this stuff. And so what are we to do? He, he says, and that you be renewed in the spirit of what? Your mind. Meaning what? Your mind, the spirit of your mind has to be changed to get away from flesh. And get into God's realm of things. God is spirit. You know, one of the greatest passages in all scriptures that's uh, often forgot about people is when the Lord visits the lady at the well. I mean, it's amazing. Well, wait, wait a minute. She says to Jesus, you say we need to go to Jerusalem to worship, but we worship here in Samaria. And the Lord said, listen, lady, let me tell you something. The time is coming when what? You will not worship there or in Jerusalem, but in spirit. See, that's what it's all about. Christianity today wants a temple to be rebuilt to bring the Lord back to kill millions of Jews. And they don't know why. It's tradition. Spirit. That dear lady ran to tell everybody in town what had just happened. Hey, he told me everything about myself. He must be. See, so it's a wonderful thing. So the spirit of your mind is, is what's said there. And put on a new self. That comes from your new birth. That God told us about, right? About yourself. And now he's telling us you have a new self. Which in the likeness of God has been created in righteousness and holiness of the truth. Therefore, laying aside falsehood, speak what to each other? Truth to each one. Of you with his neighbor, for we are members of one another. Okay? Members of one another. In other words, here we see that God writes that we lay aside the old self so that the spiritual senses, the ones he gave us, that we talked about last week, that the life of Christ is developed within us. And you know what the wonder of this is? Life goes in stages. Doesn't it? Rose just showed me a picture of her granddaughter. Your granddaughter? A great grandmother. Who would have guessed that Rose could be a great grandmother? All right. Great grandmother of a little baby girl that's about two months old. Just beautiful. What is the first stage in life? Being a baby. Right? Watch this with me. Now remember, this is God writes. Come back to 1 Corinthians chapter 3. Okay? 1 Corinthians chapter 3, please. And notice with me verse number 1. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of flesh, as to infants in what? In Christ. As to infants in Christ. So those that are of the flesh are equated to infants all right now there's a verse that goes with that i'm going to come back to second peter or first peter rather excuse me first peter chapter one and i'm going to read to you chapter two and verse number two okay where paul or peter says like newborn babies long for the pure milk of the word so that by it you may grow in respect to your deliverance or your salvation. So babyhood then is the first stage of what? Our growth toward God. See, everybody goes through that. And we began with milk. Okay, as, as you see that. The second stage brings us back to 1 Corinthians 13. Please. 1 Corinthians chapter 13, and let's notice there, verse number 11, where Paul says this, 
when I was a child, I used to speak like a child. We're in chapter 13 of 1 Corinthians verse 11. When I was a child, I used to speak like a child, think like a child, reason like a child. When I became a man, I did away with what? So the second stage after babyhood is childhood. You know, and even the Lord went through this. You read in Luke chapter number two, toward the end, when he comes back, uh, uh, his parents bring him back from the temple. He was 12 years old, missing for three days. He grew, say, in knowledge and grace towards God, as we see this. So the first stage is babyhood. The second one is childhood. And childhood then brings us well, if we want to say maturity, that is good. But to sonship, all right? To sonship. Uh, come on back to Galatians. We're almost there. Galatians, please, in chapter number four, I believe is what I want. Yes. Galatians chapter number four. Okay. And let's notice, if we would, verses five through seven, first of all. But when the fullness of time came, God sent forth his son, born of a woman, born under the law, so that he might redeem those who were under the law, that we might receive the adoption of what? Sons. Because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into our hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Therefore, you are no longer a slave, but a son. And if a son, then heir through God. So you're, you're a baby, you're a child, and now you're a what? A son. All right? Those are actually the steps that, that we see. Let's notice, there's two more verses here with this. It might be interesting to you. Come to Hebrews in chapter number 2. All right? Hebrews chapter number 2. Hebrews chapter 2. Notice verse 10 where it says this. For it was fitting for him, for whom are all things, and through whom are all things, in bringing many sons to glory, to perfect the author of their salvation through what? Through sufferings. We know the Lord suffered. Suffering comes before glory. And what's it say in Philippians chapter number 1 and verse 29? It has been given unto us, not just to believe on him, but also to what? To suffer for him. If we're going to be brought to glory as sons, we're going to suffer in this life. I just gave, uh, left the uh, new uh, edition of uh, Voices for the Martyrs. I don't know if any of you get that, okay, it, it, through the mail back here. But it says, after the bombing on the front page and it's interesting the article it's about a three or four page article about a family that was in the church and two uh what would you call them crazy people came into the church with bombs attached to them and set them off and th this this couple the father wasn't with them he was in a at a ministry for children hours and hour nine hours away all right. But the mother got up, took her kids there, and the daughter died because of the bomb blast. And this is 10 years ago. And, and you just think of the suffering that that church went through with the people that were killed. I mean, believers in our Lord Jesus Christ, because somebody disagreed with them. OK, it's really sad to me. But you know what? That's the glory of it, because the man now. All right. Ended up finishing his education. Now he's a pastor and he's planting churches, see? And he and his wife had two other children. And so it, 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 as, you, as you see that and you think about the sufferings, and of course here we don't. What kind of sufferings we go through here in America? What kind of sufferings? Mental sufferings. That's what I would say. We go through mental problems, okay? Especially when we read the Bible. We study the Bible, we find things out about the Bible, then we're afraid to say that we know what we know about the Bible. And why are we afraid to say it? <laughs> because of fear of rejection, people won't like me anymore, or, or whatever, 
okay? But the point being this that we see in Ephesians 4, 22 to 24, is that we, babyhood, children, and sonship, and who wrote about this? God wrote it. About whom? Us, see? Therefore, <laughs> come on back with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 3 again, okay? And watch this. Let me read the first three verses, then we'll go to verse 9. And I, brethren, could not speak to you as to spiritual men, but as to men of the flesh, as to infants in Christ. I gave you milk to drink. We just read that in Peter, didn't we? Not solid food, for you were not able to receive it. Why couldn't they receive it? Because they were babies. Okay? They were babies. Indeed, even now you are not yet able, for you are still what? Fleshly. For since there is jealousy and strife among you, are you not fleshly and are you not walking like mere men? So he's equating the believers here, maybe not all of them, but for the most part here, to men of the flesh. They're still children, babies, okay, as you see that. Now slide over to verse number 9 with me. Okay, <clears throat> excuse me, verse number 9. For we are God's fellow workers, you are God's field, God's building. So God had gave, gave to the church in Corinthians certain people, like Paul and those that were with him, okay? They were God's workers, and the Corinthians were what? The field. So what do you do to a field? You plow it. You know, there's, there, uh, behind our home where we live, in one plot over, uh, I don't know how many acres of farmland there is out there, but the farmer already has plowed it up and prepared it for the spring. So he can put the seeds in it come the time, you know. So then verse 10, according to the grace of God, which was given to me, like a wise master builder, I laid a foundation and another is building on it. But each man, notice this, each man, and you can say each man or woman, right, must be careful how he builds on it. For no one can lay a foundation other than the one which is laid, which is whom? It's Jesus Christ. He is the foundation. Now, God's writing a biography about you. So what's he saying to you right there and to everybody else about you? Your foundation is what? It's Jesus Christ. That's your foundation. We all there? Okay. Now that's pretty simple, isn't it? Is it or isn't it? He is the foundation. Nothing else. All right. So to put a finer point on this, spiritual growth from babyhood to childhood to sonship. Okay. Spiritual growth is repeating the journey of Jesus Christ while he was upon this earth. Okay. My son is the inclusive human. Now, this is God speaking. His son, Jesus, is the inclusive human, the last Adam. Whatever happened to him happens to every one of my children. This is because I put you where? In my son. Notice the first chapter of 1 Corinthians. Okay? And let's notice verses 29 and 30. So that no man may boast before God, but by his doing you are in Christ Jesus. Did y'all see that? Who became to us wisdom from God and righteousness and sanctification and what else? Redemption. Okay? So that just as it is written, let him who boasts, boast in whom? The Lord. We were put into him. And that's what God has written to us. That's part of your biography. That you are in Christ. I mean, to me, that's amazing. I just... Think about it for a while. You are in Christ. So you are a partaker of his divine nature. Come on over to, uh, where do we want to go? Second Peter. Okay, Second Peter. Second Peter. And let's notice chapter number one. Second Peter chapter number one. And let's uh, start at verse number uh, three, please. Seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness 
through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises, so that by them you may become partakers of what? What's it say there? Of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. Didn't Paul write that in Ephesians? Putting on the new self, getting rid of the old self, see? And Paul even brings up the, you know, the thing about the world and the lust there as, as you see this. So you begin actually then to do what as we look at this? When God is writing our biography, he's giving us all the pluses that are there for us of what we are becoming, okay? So that we can ultimately think like Jesus Christ thought. Where would I find that? Didn't we do six weeks of that recently? <laughs> About the mind of Christ? 1 Corinthians chapter 2, what verse? Good guess, 16. <laughs> the last verse of the chapter. Okay? Because now, not only that, but we have the mind of whom? We have the mind of Christ. 1 Corinthians chapter 2 and verse 16. Okay? So we say, Brother Dan, what's this all about? The journey of Jesus on this earth is your journey also. He came in the flesh, did he not? And the word was made flesh and dwelled among us. And actually, if, if you want to look at it, and I don't know the word to use, uh, he was sinless. Can you become sinless? <laughs> it depends on where you live. If you live in a spirit world, you'll be sinless. And, and keep your emphasis on God, our Lord, his spirit, okay? But if you live in the flesh, what'll happen? Just what has happened your whole life, okay? Whole life. That's why we have to allow the spirit to control us, okay? Spirit to control us. I was proud of my son Dan here just about 20 minutes ago. I say, why is that? I offered him a piece of blackberry pie in the flesh. He said, nope, can't have that, okay? Got to live in the spirit for that. Now, it's, it, that's a simple thing, isn't it? Is it a sin to eat blueberry pie or a blackberry pie? No, it is for me. It has so much sugar in it, it just sends me crazy, you know. But as, as we see this. So the journey of Jesus you have gone through, okay, as a believer. W watch this. C come, come to Galatians chapter 2 and, and notice this. So we often don't, I don't know if you think of these things very often, all right? Galatians chapter number two, please. And, and we all know this one. Verse number 20 says this, I have been crucified with Christ. Was Christ crucified? Yes. Have you been crucified? That's past tense. I have been crucified with Christ. See, his life, we live. He was crucified. We were crucified. We say, how'd that happen? Well, come back to Romans chapter number six, please. Okay. Romans chapter number six. I'm trying to be very simple here. All right. And let's just start in verse number three and, and come on down to about verse 13 or 14. Watch what it says here. Or do you not know that all of us, verse 3, who have been baptized into Christ Jesus, have been baptized into his what? Death. Now, when were you baptized into Jesus Christ? When you were dunked in water? No, it's, it's when you believed. Okay? Believed. I have a note here at the end that I'll share with you. It says, water baptism is an old covenant rite. And I'll give you a couple verses here. Okay? Talking about baptism, it's a going through something. What have you gone through? When you believed on Jesus Christ, what did you go through? You went through his cross. Okay? You were crucified, as you see. Therefore, verse 
4, we have been buried with him through baptism into death, so that as Christ was raised from the dead through the glory of the Father, we, so we too might walk in what? Newness of life. He died, he was buried. You died, you were buried. Okay? And as he was raised, now we walk in newness of life. For if we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, certainly we shall also be in the likeness of what? His resurrection. Knowing this, that our old self, now we've heard that word twice, the old self, this morning. Our old self was crucified with him in order that our body of sin might be done away with so that we would no longer be slaves to what? Sin. We're now we're back to Ephesians, Colossians, Peter, okay? Verse 7, for he who has died is free from what? Have you died? Then you're free from what? If you do what? <laughs> if you believe. Okay? Hang in there on the spiritual side, folks. For he who has died is free from sin, verse 7, verse 8. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with him. Knowing that Christ, having been raised from the dead is never to die again. Death no longer has master, is master over him. For the death that he died, he died to sin once for all. But the life that he lives, he lives to whom? To God. So if it's true about Jesus, is it true about you? So the life you live, you should live to whom? To God, it says. All right? To God. Verse number 11. Even so, consider yourselves... Account yourselves, reckon yourselves, whatever word you want to use there, to be dead to sin, but alive to God in whom? In Christ Jesus. You reckon it yourself. God has given the gifts that you need, the life that you need, the righteousness that you need to you. You just have to recognize that every day and account it to yourself as true. Okay? I'm reading a mystery book at home called The Maid. <laughs> the Maid, M-A-I-D. That uh, my daughter Jennifer gave me when she came up last year. Jennifer always gives me books. Next to my brother Tim, I get more books from Jennifer than anybody else. Okay, M a mystery book. But here's this young girl, 24 years old, is a maid in a, a really, really nice hotel in, in New York City, top of the line, you know, and she meets a young man, and she's living with her mother, by the way, okay, and, and she's very particular, that's why she's such a good maid, it's a murder mystery, but let me just tell you this part, but what happens is this, that her and her mother were cooking dinner one evening with the young man there, and he was sitting at the table, and he saw their purses sitting there, so he wrote, wrote down all their information about their bank accounts, you know, their cards. And he emptied their accounts. And the next time she had to go grocery shopping, the maid, her name was Molly the maid. Actually, it was Molly Gray. But they call her Molly maid, you know. And she went to get pay for her groceries, and there was no money. She was fleeced. They took it all. Now, you think about this, okay? She didn't report them. She says, God will take care of this problem, which to me was very interesting because this is not a religious book, okay? <laughs> God will take care of this problem, the problem being that young man, okay? Well, it hasn't happened yet, but she worked overtime to make some more money so she could feed her mother and her, and her mother dies. But at any rate, it, it, it's a good story. You say, well, what's that got to do with all this? Even so, consider yourself to be what? Dead to sin, but alive to whom? God in Christ Jesus. You ought to memorize that. Therefore, do not let sin do what? In verse 12. Reign in your mortal body so that you obey its lusts. And do not go on presenting the members of your body to sin as instruments of unrighteousness, but present yourselves to whom? 
God as those alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness to God. Now, who, who wrote this? Paul wrote this, but actually whose mind did it come from? It came from God's mind. Okay? This is what he's writing about you. And God is saying, listen, give your members over to righteousness to me, because that's what I wrote to you about. This is part of your biography. Now you think about that for a while. Don't be afraid of it. Okay? Don't be afraid of it. I mean, when I read this and look at it and think about it, and what have I taught you in the past about the most important chapters in the Bible for a believer? Romans 6, 7, 8. And actually, you can add number 5 to that. 5, 6, 7, 8. You ought to be saturated with what's in there because that's the foundation of what? Of our belief. See? And as we look at that and keep it in mind, it does nothing but bring joy to you. I mean, the idea of the, of the lusts of the world brings joy to you. Y your relationship with God is really sad. Because he said, do what? Get rid of it. All right? It's there. Don't even think about it. Okay? Don't think about it. Now, let me say this about baptism, water baptism. I, I put a note here. I'm, I'm gonna, I'll close with this. Uh, get Matthew 3 in one hand and 1 Corinthians chapter 1 in your, your other hand. Okay, say, so why do you bring this up? Well, uh, in my Facebook account, a lot of preterists, okay? There's a lot of people that, uh, what did I tell you? Matthew 3, okay? That write good things, and, and I, I really enjoy it. But then, then there are some folks that are preterists, that, and there's one guy, a gentleman, that's Israel only. And it's not even the real Israel. He thinks it's still the fleshly Israel. And they're the only ones who are going to get saved. And people ask him questions. Then why are you doing what you're doing? If you're a Gentile, what's the difference? Okay, that, that, that kind of thing. But he brings up, uh, he has a list of things. Water baptism, water baptism, water baptism, water, ba water baptism, water baptism. Whole section of things. And if you don't get water baptized, you can't have any of these things in the other column. I think mean, how sad that is. But notice chapter 3 with me in verse number 11 of Matthew. As for me, I baptize you with water for repentance. Now, to the Jewish mindset, uh, you know, the last song we sang, what's God going to, Christ going to do, Christ or God going to do with the mountains? Move them. Well, what would happen if you moved the mountains somewhere on the earth? So, so do, you know, it's like I think, you know, you talk, you talk about book of Revelation, where the stars fall. The, if the stars all fell to earth, what happened to the earth? It would be destroyed. In a Jewish mindset, what's a mountain? What's the greatest mountain? Your mind. That's the greatest mind in the Jewish mindset. You can move mountains. What can you move? You can move your mind toward whom? Toward God. That's what it's all about there. Same with water baptism here. Watch what he says here. Let me read it again. Verse, <laughs> verse number, I didn't read it all. As for me, I baptize you with water. This is John the Baptist speaking. For repentance. Water baptism was a purification rite that the Jews had for those that wanted to become Jewish. Not for Jews themselves. Now I've, I've taught you this in the past. Where they take someone and here's what they did. They stripped them. So they had no clothes on. They put them in the water. They came up. They put a robe on them immediately. And you know what they were? They were brand new people. So if a mother and a son got baptized at the same time and they came up, the son could marry the mother. They were brand new people. Watch. No, watch. The idea here is this. They were brand new creatures. That's what Paul says. They were no longer what they were before. Okay? Now, I imagine if that happened, the woman would still love her son, the son would still love the, you know, the mother, and, and that kind of thing. But the point being this, it was a rite of purification for them. That's why when John showed up and started baptizing for repentance, 
He was trying to show them things about the old covenant that they had rejected for years and years and centuries and centuries. And they flocked to him, right? So what happened here in verse number 11? But he who was coming after me, who would that be? That's the Messiah, Christ is mightier than I, and I am not fit to remove his sandals, he will baptize you with what? The Holy Spirit and fire. The Holy Spirit, not with water, the Spirit of God. Okay? Now, 1 Corinthians chapter number 1, and let's notice verse 14. And I can read 13 here. Now, the, the folks there in Corinth are having a problem about who to follow. Cephas, Christ, Paul, or Apollos, okay? But in 13 it says, has Christ been divided? Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? Talking about water baptism. I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius, so that no one would say to you, you say, you were baptized in my name. What's that show you? Was baptism then a part of salvation? No. Well, you do read it, it's clear your conscience. It had nothing to do with salvation, okay? Salvation is the work of God in a man's heart. Baptism had nothing to do with it. If, if water baptism was necessary for people to get saved, then there wouldn't be any, what, we, what do we call them, foxhole conversions? Deathbed conversions? That, that sort of thing. No. Baptism has nothing to do with that. Water baptism. You were baptized when you went through, you believed. God saw you as what? So in your biography, it reads this. Carl Carpinko has died. He's been raised. He's living in the newness of life. And he's seated, seated with my son in heavenly places. That's what Carl's biography reads. And I didn't write it. Who wrote it? God. About every one of us. Now keep that in mind. Next time I'll talk to you about glory. Oh, who? Glory. What's, what's that all about? Hope this had some blessing for you. All right? God bless you.